Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Robin Minter Smyers, a partner at Thompson Hine and the president of the City Club's Board of Directors. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker, the president and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute and the Charles E. Ducommon Professor of Education Emeritus at Stanford University, Dr. Linda Darling Hammond. This is Dr. Darling Hammond's second time at the City Club stage. Her first time was exactly six years ago today, <laughs> January 25th, 2013. In her speech, she referenced how much Cleveland has changed since the time that she lived here. A new rock hall, waterways that don't catch on fire, <laughs> and new economic transitions from manufacturing to healthcare technology and bioscience. These economic changes, both in Cleveland and in other cities around the globe, are forcing all of us, parents, educators, and business leaders alike, to rethink the way we educate our young people to prepare them for a rapidly changing world. Dr. Darling Hammond began her career as a public school teacher and co-founded both a preschool and a public high school. She served as director of the Rand Corporation's education program and as an endowed professor at Columbia University Teachers College. During her time at Stanford, she founded the Stanford Center for Opportunity Policy and Education and served as the faculty sponsor of the Stanford Teacher Education Program, which she helped to redesign. Today, she's at the helm of the Learning Policy Institute, a nonprofit that conducts and communicates independent, high-quality research to improve education policy and practice. Throughout her career, she has consulted widely with federal, state, and local officials and educators on strategies for improving education policies and practices, including serving as the leader of President Barack Obama's education policy transition team. She's the recipient of 14 honorary degrees in the U.S. and internationally. For more than a de decade, Dr. Darling Hammond has been named one of the top five education policy scholars on Dr. Rick Hess's EduPolicy Public Influence Rankings, which identifies the university-based scholars in the US who are doing the most to shape educational practice and policy. She holds a doctorate in education from Temple University and a Bachelor of Arts from Yale University. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club, please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Dr. Linda Darling Hammond. Well, that gong is so impressive. <laughs> I just can't resist. <laughs> I think if I go on too long, Robin's going to come up here and ring it again. And so I'm going to try to be compliant with the time frame. I was also told not to use a PowerPoint uh, because uh, the very wise people here at the Cleveland City Club understand that power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> so. <laughs> no PowerPoint. Yes, I'm getting some positive reinforcement for that. Uh, and I want you to know that I actually began my career in education here in Cleveland as a teacher's aide uh, in a little elementary school on the east side of Cleveland, somewhere over near 105th and Euclid, uh, uh, when I was a high school student in one of those many federal programs of the 60s that involved high schoolers in uh, summer jobs. And so that was when the teaching bug bit me. And I'm grateful to the Cleveland Public Schools for that. Um, as uh, I said a few years ago when I was here, education is changing uh, even more uh, today and tomorrow. And that's really the theme I'm going to take up for the next half hour. How do we shape education systems? 
for a fast-changing world. And uh, I have spent the last 20 years at Stanford University, uh, so I don't usually like to quote people from Cal Berkeley, which is across the bay. That's our, our big, there's probably somebody from Cal in the house. They're like everywhere. Uh, ah, <laughs> there she is. <laughs> over there too, oh my gosh. All right, but there are these very uh, smart professors over there who have been tracking the growth of knowledge in the world. And they discovered and published a study showing that between 1999 and 2003, right as we came into the 21st century, in those several years, there was more new knowledge created in the world than in the entire history of the world preceding. Think about that. So we've gone from a very linear to an exponential increase in the amount of knowledge being produced. Uh, technology knowledge, the last time I checked, was doubling every 11 months, and that's probably out of date. It's probably you know, doubling at an even faster rate now. Uh, where I live in Silicon Valley, driverless cars are becoming frequent and common, uh, and they say uh, the, those who project employment uh, I anticipate that the top 10 jobs from a decade from now are probably don't even exist right now. Uh, everyone will have to continue to uh, change throughout the uh, course of their working life. Young people are going to have to work with knowledge that hasn't been discovered yet, using technologies that haven't been invented yet, solving major problems that we have not managed to solve around uh, conflict around the world, around adequate food and water supplies, around climate change. Uh, so it completely changes the way we think about what's needed uh, in terms of the, the way people are working. There's been a huge increase in demand for people with complex thinking and performance skills, complex communication skills, a big decline in the um, labor market for people with routine skills, whether those are intellectual or mechanical, uh, physical skills. And we've seen that in Cleveland. Uh, I remember when I lived here, you know, you could take uh, your lunchbox down to the factories, you know, steel factories and so on. Uh, people without a high school education could get a good job at a good wage, raise a family, buy a house, uh, and uh, didn't need to do, you know, anything very complex. They would do the same uh, assembly line job over and over again. Those jobs are gone replaced by high-tech jobs in the medical community and others. It's happening all over the country. Fortune 500 companies at the turn in uh, 1970 uh, listed their top three skills as reading, writing, and arithmetic. But as the century turned, their top skills were interpersonal relationships, uh, communication skills, collaboration, uh, and reading, writing, arithmetic were further down the list. Uh, at Google, right up the street from me, they used to hire people based on their transcripts and test scores and grades and all those things. Uh, they did a big study, a bunch of studies, about how did that predict success at Google. Had no predictive power whatsoever, to your point uh, earlier, uh, and say so they no longer use those indicators. Uh, they try to figure out when they're hiring employees, what is your learning ability? And I don't know if you saw that funny little film called The Interns with Vince Vaughn and uh, that other guy, the Owen Wilson or somebody. Um, and they had to do all these tasks, these crazy tasks. It's not unlike that. You actually have to do performance tasks to show that you can find information, organize it, solve a problem, vet your solutions, see if you can improve it, work with other people. Uh, that's what it's all about now. So the implications for education are many of this change in the world and the workforce and so on. Uh, the nature of learning uh, is better understood and, it's, uh, and what we need is changing. Uh, not rote memorization, you know, why should you memorize a list of, you know, dates and battles that were fought? You can find it on your phone. Um, but lots of work around, not, not that facts aren't important, understanding the structure of knowledge is important, but you have to be able to problem solve and think critically and manage resources and find information and put it together with other information and make sense out of it. And so it's also a case that we need to provide for all students what was once provided for only a very few. And uh, we used to think about a thinking curriculum 
uh, as being for the 5%, you know, who would be streamed off into advanced placement or honors courses or gifted and talented and so on. Now that kind of curriculum is needed for everyone. Uh, and one of the things we see in countries that have been uh, moving forward during this era, you know, the United States is not one of the highest achieving countries in the world any longer. We rank between 25th and 39th, depending on the content area. Uh, we are no longer the highest graduation rates. We're no longer the highest college going. We're about 17th, 18th, 19th in those categories. But in these countries, many of whom had no education system to speak of, in the 1960s, and they've put it together since then. Places like Singapore, South Korea, where almost all the schools were destroyed in the Korean War and so on. Uh, what they've uh, done, among other things, if they are uh, high achieving, is uh, design a funding system so that all the schools are funded equitably, and more money goes to the places that have the kids with the greatest needs. They have uh, designed a teaching workforce so that they invest deeply in the knowledge base of all teachers and all principals. Uh, people go to school for free uh, to get trained. Uh, they often get a stipend or a salary while they're training. Uh, they um, have time in the curriculum and during the day for collaboration and, and so on. But they've also reduced, uh, and in some cases pretty much obliterated, tracking. Uh, so that they, in many countries, used to track extensively. We now track more. Uh, than most of the high-achieving countries in the world. Uh, in Finland, that was one of the big parts of their reform. In many places, uh, there may be a sort at 10th grade after kids have had a common curriculum, and then they may choose the different pathways of vocational, um, uh, technical schools, university. Uh, but the thinking curriculum, the learning to problem solve and think is throughout all of the curriculum. So I used to go to those meetings that some of you may have uh, where gifted and talented classes, and they say, we teach your children to think in this program. And I kept wondering, what are you teaching people to do in the other? <laughs> so, but you can see the differences in classrooms. You can see the differences in classrooms. So, uh, a thinking curriculum for all. The other major implication for education is what we're learning from neuroscience about how people learn. And last week, uh, I uh, co-chair a commission called the Social, Emotional, and Academic Development Commission, SEED. Um, they just had a big launch of their reports. If you want to find it on the web, you can. There are videos showing what teaching looks like when it's based in the science of learning. There are many reports about what the implications are for practice. Um, and there are a few big takeaways that we've learned about how people learn from neuroscience. Uh, that are really important to inform our schools. In fact, in the course of doing uh, the commission, we came to Cleveland because of the great work that's going on in the Cleveland public schools around uh, social and emotional learning, around restorative practices after a student was shot and killed, killed uh, other students and then killed himself. Uh, they started this whole uh, program. I don't know if anyone's, who's, who's here from the Cleveland Public Schools? All right, <laughs> Cleveland is deeply in the house. Uh, thank you for the work that you are doing. And in the course of uh, putting that in place and restorative practices rather than excluding students, giving them a place to uh, center, calm down, get tools and strategies to help themselves, uh, uh, the um, graduation rates have gone up by 50% in the last six years. Uh, and you can see evidence of the improvements throughout the entire system. So we came to see that, uh, among other things that we saw. Uh, among the things that are big takeaways from the science of learning is that, number one, emotion and learning are tightly linked. Uh, and in fact, uh, when you have a positive emotion, if you feel good about the teacher, the context, if you feel safe, if you do not feel like you're subject to stereotype threat or stigmatization, uh, if you're not anxious in those ways, you learn more effectively. Uh, if you have experienced anxiety, if you have uh, trauma that has affected you outside of school, and trauma can be reinforced inside of school with bullying and all kinds of other things that can go on, then it, you close down for learning. So number one, we have to create these very psychologically safe places uh, and positive places for learning. Uh, number two, relationships matter greatly, both for uh, the way we learn 
and for undoing the effects of trauma and toxic stress that many kids experience. I mean, we're at a moment in our society where children are being, there's sort of an aggressive neglect of children. Uh, we have more children in poverty than any other industrialized country in the world, one out of four children living in poverty. We have more children who are homeless, children without health care, children who are in food insecure context, violence, abuse, neglect. 46 million children a year in this country experience toxic stress from one or more of those types of traumas, um, which are aggregated in high poverty situations, but which extend across many, many contexts. Well, uh, that toxic stress builds up and it actually impedes learning and it impedes development in a number of ways. But one of the things that can relieve the effects of that stress are strong relationships. Um, security, safety, and uh, problem solving that comes with strong relationships. So we have to build schools so that they allow for that and our factory model schools that we inherited, particularly by middle and high school, typically don't, unless they've been redesigned, don't provide the, the you know, link to the caring adults. Uh, not that adults don't care, they do, but they're not in a situation where they can do the one-on-one -on -one work with children uh, that is needed. A great story from a neuroscientist who was doing one of these studies of infants uh, about how important interactive relationships are. Uh, they had uh, babies who had 12 weeks of training, uh, babies in the US, uh, in Mandarin, worked with an adult who helped them learn uh, some Mandarin or tried to teach them. Uh, and after 12 sessions uh, with this adult, they were able to understand Mandarin as well as babies in China. Uh, they had another group that was watching online on a video, an adult giving the same lessons in Mandarin. And after the 12 sessions, they had learned nothing in Mandarin because it was the interaction, it was the uh, way in which the interplay occurred and the baby could mimic things and be responded to that actually caused the learning. So classrooms have to be interactive. People have to be engaging with each other. We know that as we speak, we actually learn uh, that our brains uh, develop in new ways, neural pathways. Uh, and um, social emotional learning is as explicit and necessary as academic learning. In fact, Kids who are engaged in social emotional learning have a higher achievement, develop stronger achievement academically uh, because they know how to manage their attention, their emotions, uh, their ways of organizing resilience and perseverance, growth mindset, et cetera. I could go on about this as you can see, but I, I'm way afraid of the gong. So I'm going to, <laughs> I'm just gonna say, uh, go on the SEED website if you wanna learn more, but this is clearly something that matters. Uh, for how we organize our schools. And uh, uh, I'm thrilled that the Say Yes Cleveland initiative that is coming to Cleveland is going to take into account the wraparound services that kids need, uh, take into account this kind of social, emotional, as well as academic learning, uh, give kids hope for their futures if they uh, develop a growth mindset and continue to uh, be motivated and achieve. Uh, and I'm very thrilled that in Ohio, the new strategic plan for the state has a whole child framework, and I want to thank Merrill Johnson, as well as uh, how many people were involved in that? <laughs> a lot of folks were involved in writing that plan. Who else was involved in one of the committees that fed into the strategic plan? Yeah, I see a couple of other folks around here. Um, and I uh, want to recognize Paolo Di Maria, your new state superintendent, who, who organized that. Um, so. One of the great challenges we have is to get policy uh, in education that supports how people learn. Many of our policies have been at odds with how people learn, and so we're kind of trying to push a rock up the hill, and that's why the Learning Policy Institute exists. Uh, we exist to do research and organize research and evidence about how people learn and what we know about effective teaching school organizations and policy systems and carry it directly to policymakers so that they can use the evidence and redesign uh, the ways in which uh, we support schools. Many states, including Ohio, are beginning to respond to these understandings, as many countries already have done. We're getting a slow start because, frankly, no child left behind. Uh, which we have left behind. Um, at least some people used to call it no child's behind left, I heard. <laughs> um, really focused everyone on uh, ra raising scores only on 
pretty low level multiple choice tests. Um, now, if you think that what you have to do in the world today is pick one answer out of five that's already provided, you know, you've missed the boat as to what's going on in the society and the workplace now. So, I mean, they have some value, but they do not represent most of the learning that needs to go on. And then that was also coupled with punishments, which actually we know from the science of learning don't work. And B.F. Skinner announced this back in the 1950s. He said, you know, he was the father of extrinsic rewards and punishments. He said, punishment doesn't work. Uh, it causes people to narrow their perspectives and try to double down on what they know, but to be afraid to learn things that they don't know and try new things. So we're coming out of 15 years of kind of focusing uh, in the wrong direction and we're having to rebuild policies to focus on the kind of critical thinking and problem solving, the kind of whole child perspective that other countries have been pursuing. So uh, they have often will tell me, I've, I've written a book recently called Empowered Educators, which is about work in five other countries uh, that are high achieving. They'll often say we got those ideas from the US because we are the best innovators in the world and they will come and look at your school and they'll look at your university and look at that program and go back and scale it up. Uh, we often uh, you know, uh, are in danger of innovating ourselves to failure because we innovate, create something, the money runs out, the you know, governance changes and we get rid of it and then we start all over again. So the, we have to now uh, take a lesson from them about how do you scale up, how do you build a system that's there for every child, for every teacher, for every principal, for every school and community uh, to ensure that there is adequate resourcing, that there's high quality early childhood learning and support, uh, welfare supports for children, uh, a curriculum focused on higher order thinking skills, and investments in the quality and knowledge base of educators so that they can put that all to work. Those are the pieces. And I see this happening uh, in uh, Ohio as the strategic plan is coming out and as the state is looking forward uh, with the um, uh, support that ESSA can provide. Um, you know, one of the important things about the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, fondly known as ESSA to those of us in the biz, um, <laughs> it, is, uh, it was a, a bipartisan law. Lamar Alexander, Patty Murray came together, worked it through. Uh, it has a whole child perspective in the sense that it asks for multiple measures of how schools are doing and how children are doing. And states that are innovative are taking advantage of the freedom under that law to redefine education. The other good thing about that bipartisanship is that over the last few years, every year, the Congress has gotten together and raised the funding for ESSA. Uh, frankly, our president's budgets have zeroed out, uh, have proposed to zero out a lot of that funding, but the Republicans and Democrats in the Congress every year come together and recommit to that vision for education. It changes the framework from a test and punish framework to an assess and improve framework, uh, from a test score only to a whole child approach. Uh, and you can see in the uh, Ohio strategic plan some of the key elements, and I hope that these will move forward into policy. Uh, one of the things that is important in accountability systems is that you look at all the things you care about and give people the data that will allow them to continuously improve. The name of the game is not to punish but to improve and to create a system by which you're always looking at how are our kids doing by groups and uh, stimulate that improvement process. So in addition to achievement, we look at graduation rates. In some states, we have uh, people looking at growth on multiple measures uh, in many subject areas besides reading and math, science and civic engagement. We have a, in California, a seal of civic engagement that uh, is actually counted in the college and career index. Many states have put together this sort of indicator of college and career readiness, which allows them to see how many kids are getting access to and succeeding in high quality career courses of study, high quality college prep courses of study, things like international baccalaureate, advanced placement, early college, dual credit. Um, it's not only are we 
making progress and giving people credit for it. And in New York and California, there's a seal of biliteracy that's counted there. Ohio has such a seal. Uh, they count it in the accountability system. If you get more people to be bilingual, uh, then you know that's part of it. Uh, and as I said, we're having a seal of civic engagement developed in California because we want civically engaged citizens. It gives you a picture of what we want children to become that you can incentivize schools to pursue. And when the reporting is done by all of the groups that are required under ESSA, by race and ethnicity and poverty and uh, special ed status and so on, you can see who's getting the good stuff and who is not. And the issue in the, our schools is to make sure everybody gets the good stuff. You know, we're, we've got to be expanding it. One of the other things schools and systems need to be doing at the state level and the local level is when we have things that are succeeding, rather than rationing them to a few people who can get in, you try to expand it so that more people can get it, right? And so we got to move from this notion of scarcity of the good stuff uh, to a notion of how do we train teachers and enable kids to get access to empowering, engaging, thoughtful uh, curriculum. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, other states are looking at school climate indicators uh, where kids take surveys about the climate, teachers are engaged in surveys, parents are engaged in surveys, and you can see what's working. Do kids feel that they belong? Are they getting the supports they need for social and emotional development? And then those become part of an ongoing continuous improvement process because you can say, what are we gonna work at in our school this year? Uh, to make sure that there is this sense of safety, belonging, engagement uh, in the whole uh, child uh, part of learning. Um, these data, as I said, also help you uh, learn how to improve equity. In a number of states, rather than the old system of giving each school a score or a grade level, an A, B, C, D, or F, uh, they're presenting the whole dashboard of all these indicators, and then they can use uh, how kids, schools are doing to decide which 5% are needing to get intervention and support, but everybody is encouraged and given the information to improve on all of those indicators. Uh, and the goal is not to rank the schools against each other or to give them a label, but to give them the information that they need, that parents need, that teachers, educators need to improve. So I hope we'll see that uh, evolution. If you think about the difference between a dashboard and a single summative score, uh, like a letter grade, uh, if you, on your, in your car, if you got into your car and there was something in the middle of the dashboard that said B plus, how would that help you? <laughs> I want to know how much gas do I have? What is my tire gauge? What's my pressure? What are my fluids? Uh, I need the dashboard. I need all of those indicators. Uh, similarly, if your kid came home with a report card and it said, we've given your kid, your kid is an 82. How does that help you? I want to know how's my kid doing in math and reading and social studies and citizenship and, you know, I don't know if they grade citizenship anymore, but they used to in the olden days. <laughs> I always had the little thing that said, Linda talks too much in class. <laughs> so I'm still working on that. Uh, so just as we need to know more about schools, we need to know more about students. And assessment needs to evolve. If you look at assessment in other countries, uh, we are alone in the annual multiple choice test phenomenon. We do more testing of our kids than any other country in the world, and we use multiple choice tests almost exclusively. If you go to Finland, Singapore, uh, Australia, you know, places in Canada, where they have assessments there once every three years, typically, and they are typically open-ended essays and problem solutions, and in a growing number of countries, they are performance tasks. They are design a science experiment uh, to test a proposition, conduct it, write up the findings. Teachers then are trained to score those pieces of evidence. So kids are engaged in a thinking curriculum. Uh, in Singapore, when I was there, they do that in every science class. Uh, and in 10th grade, they have an engineering and design class, and you have to design a solution collaboratively with a team to a problem that is set by the examinations board, and people invent things, and they uh, try them out, and they test them, and they improve them, and they write it up, and they have a research journal, and talk about who did what uh, in their group, and they present it. All of that is scored 
as part of the assessment system, but it, it's the kind of work that we want kids to be engaging in. And one of the things in Ohio's strategic plan that I was thrilled to see is an emphasis on evolving the assessment so that they really capture learning in these ways and so that we give credit, as some uh, states are doing, to kids who complete very complex graduation portfolios, showing their competencies at scientific investigation and social science inquiry and literary analysis and mathematical uh, modeling and problem solving uh, and language uh, acquisition and so on. Uh, so I think that that's, that's part of getting ready for the 21st century. If what you know when you graduate from high school is how to find one answer out of five, and you go to Google, and they want to find out your learning ability, and you say, well, what are my five choices? You know, you are, you are out of a job. It is cognitively toxic to think that most of learning should be finding one answer out of five that are already provided. That's not what we do in life. So we've got to move our system to really replicate more of what the challenge really is. Uh, it's for this reason that 1,000 colleges, more than 1,000, have become test optional. They're looking for more useful information. And uh, Learning Policy Institute has joined with the higher ed organizations, the presidents, the admissions counselors, uh, and a variety of other uh, institutions, uh, state systems, individual colleges, and K-12 institutions to create a way by which colleges can use this kind of information from portfolios and performance assessments for admissions, placement, and graduation. And I'm here to tell you, you'll be the first audience that hears this, that we have an agreement with the Common App that they are going to have a space where you can put your portfolio evidence for a student so it can be considered uh, by universities. And the universities <laughs> are ecstatic about the possibility that they can look at kids differently, that they can see uh, what they've accomplished academically, but also there are a couple hundred colleges now involved in making caring common, which is they want to know about kids' compassion, their ways of taking care of each other, their family, their communities. Uh, what have they learned uh, in the being a human category? Uh, and that's also part of what colleges want to have in this new uh, era of information for admissions and uh, placement and counseling. So uh, it's a very interesting time, and in the uh, Strategic Plan for Ohio is a section about how uh, the way we think about who graduates should be informed by multiple ways of demonstrating uh, what kids know and can do. Uh, that's happening all across the country as well. There were once 26 states with exit exams, there are now only nine, and most states are moving towards a competency-based system where they're trying to find evidence and support kids in engaging in critical thinking and serious work uh, to develop that evidence. Um, the characteristics of what we want in our children must be more present in our schools on an equitable basis and in our policies. Uh, and that's our task over the coming decade. To accomplish that, we need to bring policy in line with how people learn. That means investing in a curriculum and assessment that are focused on the critical thinking and problem solving that I've described, investing in teachers and school leaders so that everyone has access to the knowledge and skills that they need to do this kind of new work. Uh, teachers should not have to be looking under rocks for knowledge. And in other countries, they uh, bring you through a preparation, mentoring, and professional learning system that is readily available and is always developing expertise. And as teachers develop expertise, they're recognized as senior teachers, mentor teachers, and so on. And then they're given opportunities to share their expertise with others. We need a system that produces and shares expertise across classrooms, across schools, uh, across regions, uh, across the whole state. And so the state needs to think of itself as a learning organization uh, and a, a proponent of learning systems uh, a, as opposed to a compliance manager. Uh, and so that's part of the challenge we see going on all across the country, um, investing equitably in, um, in schools so that kids who have greater needs uh, produce more funding, uh, and then they can use that for meeting that range of needs, and then designing schools so that they provide uh, the kind of relationships 
uh, looping for young children so that the same teacher is with them for more than one year. That, that has such a huge effect on achievement that when they did the big class size studies years ago, they had to take the looping classrooms out of the sample because they were producing so much higher achievement it was uh, skewing the results to look at class size reduction. Uh, relationships matter. If you know those kids and you stay with them, you know the families, you begin to understand how to work with the kids uh, that you didn't understand back in November. Uh, the same thing with advisories in middle and high schools so that uh, every teacher has 15 or 20 kids that they know well and they stay with for two, three, four years and that kid always knows who their advocate is, who's going to help them with whatever it is. That family always knows who they can call uh, to move that child forward. We need relationship-centered schools uh, if we're going to build on the science of learning and development. So I'm going to close, uh, I'm over time, <laughs> uh, with the words of John Dewey, uh, who plagiarized everything I thought before I thought it. So. <laughs> You've had that experience, you, you know that. And this is my favorite. Uh, what the best and wisest parent wants for his or her child, that must the community want for all of its children. Any other goal is narrow and unlovely. Acted upon, it destroys our democracy. Only by being true to each individual and his potential can society be true to itself. I think that's what we're about here, thank you. <laughs> I was that kid who always wanted to play with all the you want to, you know you want to do it. Right? <laughs> Today we are listening to a forum with Dr. Linda Darlingham, and President and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute, and the Charles E. Ducommon Professor of Education Emeritus at Stanford University. We're about to begin the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, or those of you joining us via our radio broadcast or live stream. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try to work it into the program. Holding the microphones today are content coordinator Bliss Davis and marketing and outreach coordinator Julia Wang. May we have the first question, please? Good afternoon. Uh, first, thank you for your inspiring and empowering remarks, and it's an honor to be here with so many people who really care about children, uh, not only in Cleveland, but in Ohio. And um, I, too, like you and many others, are very excited about the new strategic plan, and yes, thank you, Merle, and others. Um, <laughs> One of the many things that you said um, was turning the state of Ohio into a learning institution rather than um, a compliance manager. Um, you said it better, but that was my takeaway. Um, my, my thought, since we have the expert in the room, is what would be your recommendations for first steps and how to do that um, as far as assessment and giving uh, schools and empowering teachers and others uh, and parents um, with the dashboard that you spoke of. And I love that analogy, by the way, of the <laughs> dashboard versus the A, B, R in your car. Yeah. Thank you. Well, there's a lot in that question. So <laughs> I do think, you know, to what you've already said, that, um, you know, putting together a dashboard where you really can see how schools are doing on these multiple dimensions, uh, as is uh, suggested in the strategic plan, is a, an important piece. But then you need a continuous improvements process. You need a way by which schools are expected to look at those data and make plans for how they're going to improve, for how, uh, you know, the state is going to look at those data and think about how it can improve what it does. Um, we have a little innovation in California, which is interesting. We had a new funding formula put in place that puts more money per child for kids in every district who are uh, low-income English learners or foster care or homeless. So we have a much more progressive system. And when it came in, it came in with something called the Local Control Accountability Plans. Every local community, and they have, we have eight state priorities and lots of indicators of how kids are doing in a whole child framework. And um, so districts have to look uh, at how their kids are doing by subgroups and overall on all those indicators. And every three years they have to write a local control uh, plan uh, with input from the community, 
Uh, there has to be parent involvement, community involvement, uh, educator involvement in doing that. Uh, and then every year, there has to be an annual update to the plan, looking at the data about how kids are doing, and then how are we going to spend our new money? The categorical strings were taken away from the funding, but now the question is, how are you going to spend your uh, unrestricted funds to make progress on all of these areas for children? And to do that in collaboration with the community. The county offices are the ones who oversee the process with the plans. Uh, but that's only one way to think about it. Lots of people have developed innovations for creating a continuous improvement process. The other thing you want the state to do and you want districts to do, uh, we have expertise all over the place. Every district has some great teachers, uh, some schools that are doing wonderful things. Creating those learning opportunities across the classrooms, across the schools, holding up, doing research about the places that are making terrific gains, you know, getting those on a website, you know, if you want to see who's succeeding with English learners, you ought to be able to go and see that there are, you know, here are four districts that are doing really great work. And then there might need to be not only that research on them that you could read and learn about what they've done, but also site visits to go visit and see, you know, what that work is that is going on. And you see that in places like Shanghai, uh, Singapore, Finland. They're always evaluating what's going on, and then they're holding up success and helping people learn from it. And that can be a job at the district office, the county, uh, and the uh, state. So that you have a learning system. Uh, Ontario does that as well. They have a wonderful system in Ontario, Canada that we could learn from in that regard. Speaking of tomorrow's world, um, the health of the earth is not very good, and it doesn't seem to be getting better. What should education look like to help solve that? Well, you know, I would hope that we have really deep uh, and strong science instruction about the earth, the climate, the ways in which, um, you know, uh, both natural and man-made sources are affecting us and what can be done about it. We, I mean, we've got to solve this problem, like, fast. There's not a lot of time to be monkeying around on this. Um, you know, one of the things that was a shortcoming under NCLB was that people stopped teaching science. Uh, and, you know, we, we need it. Uh, so I think one of the things that educationally we need, we need to really be investing in science learning uh, and environmental learning. Uh, one of the things that um, is great about, I'm so excited about the active civics movement in California that's going to lead to our seal of civic engagement. We had to actually move away from, uh, there was one bill that came to the legislature which asked for a multiple choice test in civics in 11th grade, you know, to promote civics. That was like not what a lot of us thought civic engagement would look like, uh, cramming for another multiple choice test. So, uh, in fact, uh, for civic engagement, kids can take up causes that they want to engage in and really do a um, you know, substantial piece of work on that or other areas where there are social needs. Uh, good afternoon. I'm so glad you're here today. Thank you for the great shout out on the Ohio Strategic Plan. Uh, I'm very proud of the work, especially in the graduation requirements. We're expanding those, as you said. Um, Ohio has moved uh, forward. 20 steps, but it's moved back 100 steps in our legislators creating something called a state takeover, mm. um, in which they target uh, low-income districts, predictably, and uh, a CEO is hired, a stranger comes in, five people are appointed who replace the elected school board. Uh, the CEO has um, a tremendous power, uh, including um, removing the, the union rights except for wage and benefits, hiring, firing. Um, it's a horrible, oppressive law. And in the three districts, two districts has been used in Ohio, uh, Youngstown and Lorraine, there has been minimal improvement. Um, and now a new district has been taken over, East Cleveland, and uh, the community is frantic. Uh, my point is that instead of addressing the real issues um, like poverty and the kinds of situations that's, that's created because of poverty, they're not addressing that. Our legislators instead think that uh, taking over a district is going to suddenly improve it. And so my question to you is, are state takeovers a good idea? <laughs> <laughs>
What are my choices? What are my five choices? You know, there's so many things Im embedded in what you're talking about. And, you know, one of them is the you know, fact that we've been sort of criminalizing poverty in a lot of different ways. And, and that, is, that is one of them. You know, state accountability systems that, I mean, there's a, generally speaking, and there have been a lot of studies, there's about a 0.9 correlation between uh, level of poverty or socioeconomic status and test scores. So if the only thing you measure is the absolute test score, then you're always going to have the high poverty uh, communities near the bottom and then they can be taken over or whatever. Uh, in some states they've really done a lot in terms of the indicators to begin to measure growth looking at the value that's added by schools rather than just the absolute. Because really what is a school's effectiveness? The school's effectiveness is moving you from here to here not you know where you start. Um, and so that actually changes quite a lot. Uh, what you think about how schools are being run and what you learn about what they're doing and how they're progressing. Um, so one piece of what you're talking about is how do you look at schools and districts. Uh, the other is what do you do about it? And what is your learning system? And that's the other piece of this. Uh, in the countries that I visited, you know, they develop a learning system. In Shanghai, how successful schools partner with less successful schools, um, and they actually share staff. So a team of people goes from the more successful school to, and they're similarly similar demographically. So uh, they'll go to the less successful school. The less successful school send a team to the more successful school for a couple of years. So one school is getting an input of new knowledge and learning, and they're getting a lot of other professional development sports. The other uh, team is going to see what it looks like when it's in action. Then when they go back, uh, both places have been changed. It's just one example. But that's a better way of thinking. I mean, we have to think about learning systems. How are we going to help? schools that are failing, and there are schools that are failing, and we do want to do something uh, to improve them. We've got to think about how that's going to work. Um, mostly state takeovers have not produced strong gains. There have been a few cases where they've wrapped around the amount of resources that are needed, the amount of learning that's needed, the you know, system that helps people improve that have really made a difference. But Absent all of those investments and resources and a learning mindset, um, just changing the people at the top has not generally um, made a huge difference. See, you couldn't do that on a multiple choice test. I would just say D. <laughs> Thank you. I found your presentation really informative. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like your position is um, that letter grades are not a good indicator of like, intellect. And so I'm in the social work school and the law school at Case Western. And in law school, of course, grades are everything. In fact, you can't even apply for certain jobs if you don't have a particular GPA. Whereas in a social work school, uh, grades are important, but there's not as much emphasis, it's less competitive. And so do you, my question is, do you think that there are particular areas of study where letter grades are a good indicator of intellect? Well, I'm not against letter grades in school per se, although I happen to like narrative report cards where you get to say more about what students know and can do. I was really talking about giving a school a single letter grade to denote the quality of the school um, rather than having more indicators in which you can see how the school is doing in more areas. But um, I think that whether you talk about law school or social work school or whatever, uh, in higher ed in most cases, um, good schools have many, many, many indicators that they collect. My husband's a law school professor, so I get to suffer through that, um, both, <laughs> both the scoring of the exams and the uh, admissions of the students. Uh, they, they do look, of course, at, um, they look at LSATs, they look at grades, they look at class rank, but they also look at a lot of other accomplishments that people have had, and they take those into account when they're putting a class together. So my point is really not whether we get rid of those indicators, uh, class rank actually is the high, is the most predictive uh, of college uh, success, more predictive than admissions tests, um, and it means something. It's, it tells you something about how people did in school and how hard they worked and what they accomplished, uh, but it's not alone, and so my point is that it's a multiple measures approach. You need to have 
many measures of how people are contributing and learning and accomplishing and doing if you want to really know what they can, um, can do. So. Hi, I appreciate all your uh, imparting here with the, your knowledge, but I wondered in your um, studies with especially other countries, um, how much more uh, their arts-inspired curriculums oh, play into yes. being than ours do, and uh, also the length, of, uh, the length of the school year. Okay, uh, those are really different questions. Let me start with the arts. <laughs> Uh, now I'm going to get into my neuroscience stuff for just a minute, uh, pardon me, but we know something about how neural pathways and connections are developed in the brain, and among the things that really are important are symbol systems. Music uh, actually uh, enhances uh, the brain's development. Art, which is another symbol system. Languages, which are another symbol system, having multiple languages, actually develops your brain. If we were thinking about neural development we would do as they do in Finland. If you go there, um, the kids have music every day. Uh, art is very frequent, and in, uh, in uh, Singapore, Shanghai, the two places I went, uh, in, particularly in the early grades, the uh, early uh, learning is very art-focused, very um, uh, music-focused. There's a lot of engagement. In, in the other thing that helps develop the brain is physical activity. We actually know that when you're walking, you actually think better than when you're standing still. For some people, kids who get labeled as ADHD, they actually do better academically if they can move around. But everybody uh, does better with physical activity. Well, in Finland, every hour in the hour, they go out uh, for 15 minutes. Even the little kids put their boots on and their snowshoes and so on. So their brain is always active. We had under NCLB schools that got rid of recess uh, to keep the kids sitting in front of a desk uh, doing test prep on multiple choice questions. It was killing their brains, literally. literally. Uh, it reduces your mental capacity. So yes, art, music, languages, uh, physical fitness, green space, all of these things actually promote neural connections and uh, brain capacity and achievement. Uh, and so there's a very interesting, if we were to design schools around that, they would be very different places. Uh, the other thing I already said is interaction, language, you know, talking to each other. So you would not have silent classrooms. Uh, you'd have uh, some teacher talk for sure, uh, but kids would also be structured to have uh, you know, useful uh, conversations between their art and their music. When I took a group of Congress people to Finland for a little tour, uh, and we were looking at, you know, they were number one on PISA. Everybody was shocked when the Finns came out on top. And the Finns will tell you we just wanted to be ahead of the Swedes. That was their only goal. <laughs> and in the 1960s, they only had 10% of their uh, people graduating from high school. They were not considered the academic you know, powerhouse in Scandinavia. But they put in place a very substantial teacher education, two-year master's program for all teachers in which they learned all of this about brain science and about development. And they focused on how do you teach kids with special needs and learning differences. You can't be a primary teacher in Finland unless you can play the piano. Uh, and you have to be able to. And you have music every day, et cetera, and, and art. Uh, so when the, the congressman was asking, well, how do you get these great results? You know, one of the teachers said, well, you know, play is very important. Music is very important. And he went through this whole list, and, you know, Americans were like, what? We, those are frills. Well, the frills are actually at the center uh, of much of uh, brain development. So it's a really interesting question. Thank you. Oh, school year. Uh, school year doesn't matter. <laughs> Um, very much. I mean, it, it's not predictive. I don't mean to say it doesn't matter, but um, some of the highest achieving countries in the world have smaller uh, instructional hours uh, per year, and we, our teachers teach more instructional hours per year than teachers in any other country in the world. Uh, and we're tied for Korea on instructional hours taught uh, and for Chile in instructional hours per week, so per year and per week. Um, it's the quality of instruction, uh, and um, it is also true that time matters, and when kids are behind, you may need more time, you know, so I'm not saying that time doesn't matter, uh, but the quality of the use of time 
matters really uh, a lot. <laughs> and um, so there's not a strong relationship between the length of the school year, and ours is not so much shorter. But here's one last fact. I can see that it's my time is about to be up. Um, the uh, way many uh, countries structure their school year does not have a big summer vacation. So you might have, you know, 12 weeks on and two or three weeks off and then 12 weeks on and two or three weeks off. So kids aren't forgetting. We have a lot of summer learning loss because we've got this two, you know, and a half month. And we know that that matters more for kids who are not getting other intellectually engaging work. And so, uh, it, you know, one of the things that Johns Hopkins study found was that if you look at the difference between rich and poor ninth graders and their achievement, a third of the difference was present at kindergarten unless you had high quality preschool, and two thirds of the difference was accounted for by summer learning loss uh, for poor kids who are not getting intellectually. So you would put in place rich, engaging summer schools with lots of um, arts and music as well as academics, and maybe physical activities as well, and you would put in place high quality preschool. Today at the City Club, we have been listening to a forum with Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond, President and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute and the Charles E. Ducommon Professor of Education Emeritus at Stanford University. Today's forum is part of our Education Innovation Series sponsored by the Nortzen Corporation Foundation. We're delighted to have Cecilia Render and Cynthia Tanner with us today. Thank you for your continued support of City Club education programming. It's also part of our Authors and Conversation series, supported in part by the residents of Cuyahoga County through a public grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. We're grateful to all of the residents of Cuyahoga County for their support through that public grant. Today's forum is the Nathu R. Agarwar, Agarwal and Roy G. Blackburn Forum, made possible by a generous grant from Raj and Karen L. Agarwal. We're delighted to have Raj Agarwal and Linda Robertson with us today. Thank you for your continued support of City Club programming. Today's forum is presented in partnership with the Cleveland State University Center for Educational Leadership and the Greater Cleveland School Superintendents Association. We thank you for your continued support of the City Club. Community partners for today's forum include the C Cleveland Transformation Alliance, IPM and Minds Matter. Thank you for your partnership in promoting today's forum. Lastly, we welcome guests at tables hosted by Cuyahoga Community College, the Gelfand, Gelfand STEM Center at Case Western Reserve University, and the Northeast Ohio Friends of Public Education and students from Flow Homeschool Co-op, MC Squared STEM High School, and the St. Martin de Porres High School. Support for student participation in City Club forums comes from KeyBank and the William M. Weiss Foundation with additional support from the donors you'll find listed in today's program. We thank all of you for being here today. The sale of Dr. Darling Hammond's book, The Flat World in Education, How America's Commitment to Equity Will Determine Our Future is provided by a cultural exchange. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Dr. Darling Hammond. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.